Hi, uh, everybody. Welcome to MedCan Presents. This is our regular webinar series uh, that goes out every second Tuesday. Today's webinar is how to prepare for a pandemic winter. So travel options are limited. Many athletic activities are curtailed and stress relieving options are restricted. So what should you do to stay mentally healthy as temperatures fall and the winter approaches? MedCan's Eat, Move, Think panel of Director of Food and Nutrition, Leslie Beck, Fitness Manager, Anna Topali, and psychologist Dr. Jonathan Danson will provide guidelines and inspiration on how to turn this unusual winter into a healthier and happier one. So we're going to start with a poll uh, just as people come in. Um, it takes a minute uh, for, I see the numbers rising and we're doing pretty well, but let's go through the poll um, just to give people a minute to come in. So how do you feel about the upcoming winter season? Very concerned is the first question. Factor in dealing with the pandemic, and I don't know how I'm going to get through it. A little concerned is the second option, and so I'm eager for advice, so we're going to provide that uh, today. I'm okay is the third. I'm just going to keep my head down and get through it. Uh, fourth, I'm not concerned at all. Give me a little outside time, even in winter, and I'll be fine. And then the fifth is I'm excited about the winter. It's my favorite season, and even COVID can't stop that. So let's give people a uh, second or two to, to answer that. I see our panelists are on. Uh, let me start with Leslie Beck, our Director of Food and Nutrition over here at MedCan. Leslie, how are you today? I'm great, Chris. You know, as you can see, I'm back in the office today, which um, although I, I do work, do a lot of virtual work with our clients, some people are coming in, which is great. And it's just nice to be in the office a little bit of, uh, to see faces as well, masked faces, of course, but it's just nice to be around people as well. That's great, fantastic. Anna Topali, fitness manager at MedCan. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. I'm working remotely. I'm in my big comfy chair and uh, yeah, just living the dream over here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jonathan Danson, clinical psychologist at MedCan. How are you today? Doing very well, thanks. Obviously also at home. Um, I haven't been to MedCan for about eight months, so you'll have to excuse me if you hear screaming babies or anything in the background, um, but uh, that's working from home. No, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll. I see we have tons of uh, people and I'm going to share the results. So, okay, so in terms of how do you feel about the upcoming winter season? So 11% said very concerned. 55% said a little concerned. And so I'm eager for advice. That's great. We'll provide that. 26% said, I'm okay. I'm just going to keep my head down and get through it. 8% said, I'm not concerned at all. And then 2%, uh, I'm excited about the winter. It's my favorite season and even COVID can't stop that. So I, I, actually that is me. I am, um, I'm kind of a winter guy and I actually, I love winter. So. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Uh, it's Sunday, it's freezing rain. There's no chance you're going outside and you're probably not going inside to a movie or restaurant. Panelists, eat, move, think panelists, how do you cope? Anna, why don't you start with some advice on that topic? Absolutely. So I'm a big believer in doing something active every day and bad weather shouldn't hinder you from doing that. So an easy relaxing go-to for me would be to roll out a yoga mat, um, play some relaxing music, light a little candle maybe, and then um, pick from the, there's tons of options for virtual yoga classes or even Pilates mixes. Um, and kind of do that to unwind from the week. Now, if I'm feeling a bit more energetic, for example, a quick circuit type that you could do is picking five body weight exercises. So for example, you could do 20 squats, 20 reverse snow angels, 10 lunges per side, 10 pushups, and uh, 20 plank rows. And so you have your five exercises alternating upper body and lower body and then set a timer for 20 minutes and try and do as many rounds of that as you can and play around with it. So you could do 20 minutes one day, 25 minutes another day, half hour, more or less exercises, get creative. And then actually a fun suggestion from one of our trainers, Teresa Barbieri, who is a mom of two very active boys. Her suggestion is a game of Simon Says and you turn it into a workout. So it could be, for example, Simon Says, leap like a frog 20 times. Simon says, you know, sprint to the back of the yard and back however many times. And then if you want to add in some resistance training, Simon says, pick up your kids and squat with the kids 20 times. I mean, you could get so creative with it. So um, that was a fun little suggestion from her. 
Anna, a uh, reverse snow angel. What, it, what exactly is a reverse snow angel? Yeah, so if you're, so instead of doing the snow angels face up to the sky, you're face down, keeping your head neutral with the rest of your body and you're still doing the exact same motion, trying to get your hands as far away from the ground as you can. For the, for back so, muscles. Okay. Exactly, activating your back because we're sitting so much crouched this way. So we're just trying to strengthen muscles on, on your back, exactly. Okay. Upper okay, back, cool. yeah. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to chime in on this one? Um, is kind of, you know, to, uh, dovetails into the uh, think portion, you know, a long freezing rain kind of day can be a tough to get through. Yeah, uh, well, so let me first say I'm big on routine. I think routine is really important. In fact, that's why I'm wearing a collared shirt, even though I'm at home, it's part of kind of my morning routine. I won't show you the shorts I'm wearing beneath this. Um, but I think what's really important about weekends is that we, to some degree, change that routine. So my fear is for people, if you're expecting to go out and do the fun things, but it's freezing, freezing rain or whatever, and there's nowhere else to go, that people are going to fall back into their normal kind of weekday routine, do some chores, do some work and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think it's really important to have a plan of, I, I think we should assume we're going to be staying home sometimes with nothing to do. So have a good plan of what are the kinds of things you like to do when you're home. Uh, I know some people even have activities that they only do on weekends. Uh, my version of that is if I come across a good psychology article, um, as much as I want to read it in the evening, I rarely have the energy to. So I like to kind of pile those up for the weekend. And then if I'm stuck inside, uh, I'll kind of get through those. Um, so generally having a good list of activities you can do that don't really feel like a backup plan that you hopefully are maybe to some degree excited to do if you're stuck at home. Um, but also if you're like me, I find it very hard to be at home and not do chores. Like I can't look at uh, leaves that need to be raked and not get, like, get myself and not do it. Um, so in that case, I try to bank a day. Uh, so what I mean by that is if I'm gonna do chores because I'm stuck inside on a Sunday and if my kid allows me to do chores, um, then I'll try to bank a day for later. So on, a, let's say a Tuesday, I'll try to take the night off and do the kinds of things I would have wanted to do on the weekend instead. Fantastic. Okay, that's so well. So now let's transition from the micro, from a single individual day, to the macro, to the slog of the winter. To you know, it's dark, it's cold, uh, and the way that we kind of get through, the Canadians get through uh, the winter is with by socializing or 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 by maybe by going to the gym. So there are dinner parties, there's gyms usually, you can go to see a movie, go to a restaurant, none of that stuff. You know, we may end up with much of a winter where none of that stuff is an option. So um, Dr. Danson, D uh, John, why don't you uh, start with this one? How do you get through the slog of the winter, the macro of the winter? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll start by saying, I think that we have a general over-reliance on this idea of motivation. It's a bit of a cultural idea that you have to be motivated to act. So we all think to some degree that you build up your motivation and then you act as a result of that motivation. But the reality is, and the literature says that's, of course that's true, but it's not always true. Uh, often our motivation comes from the action itself. So my fear is that during this kind of pandemic winter, we don't have the things in our schedule that we normally have. Like you said, we're not, we don't have the work events, we don't have the birthday parties, the holidays and all that. And I fear that people are gonna think in the absence of those, what they need to do is find the motivation to go out and do their own thing, to figure out some ways to socialize. But that motivation often comes from action. So without action, we're not gonna be motivated. Without motivation, we're not gonna act. So I suggest that people put things in their schedule that are hard to skip. Um, just like a birthday party, you say yes to it. And then we don't think to ourselves, how motivated am I to go to that party? We just get the boots on, get the jacket on, venture out into the freezing cold darkness. And generally speaking, once we're there, that's when we can get motivation to actually continue being there and having fun. Um, so I think it's really important that in the absence of all these events that are scheduled for us um, to book in events explicitly. Um, as a quick example, I like I think a lot of people these days, I book in um, Zoom calls with my friends, but I almost invariably find that the couple hours before that call, I have no interest in doing it. I'm tired from work day. I don't feel like talking anymore. Uh, you know, I have chores to do and all that. But because it's in my schedule, I generally do it. And I invariably find that within five minutes of being on that call, I'm having fun and I'm motivated to be there. So again, here, I'm not waiting to feel motivated to do something with my friends. I'm putting it into my schedule, acting without motivation, and then watching as kind of motivation can, uh, can build the other way. Fantastic. Yeah, I, uh, the Zoom calls with friends, I absolutely, I think we can all uh, identify with that uh, together. Okay. We know, so actual activities, we know we're probably going to have to embrace winter and outdoor activities more than normal this year. You know, so, so some of the base, you know, in terms of we're, what we're trying to achieve here is non-obvious advice. Some of the obvious advice is get outside and, and engage in winter activities. But 
the difficulty here is, you know, even like skiing is, is kind of tricky this year. You have to book times and things like that. So what are some suggestions for winter activities that we can do that get us outdoors? Anna, why don't you start with this one? And then after this, we're going to segue into some food stuff uh, for Leslie. But so let's start with uh, Anna. Absolutely. So I will start by just mentioning that the Canadian Society of Exercise Physiologists, they suggest accumulating at least 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise in the span of a week. So if you break that down into more realistic, very doable bouts, it could be up to 10 minutes a day that you're just getting outside. So easiest way to do that, honestly, walking and a fairly brisk pace on the walk, but great way to get fresh air, great way to be socially distanced and to get those minutes of exercise in. So tons of parks, conservation areas that you could go exploring, um, pretty neighborhoods with their pretty Christmas lights on, but just make sure that during that walk, you are getting your heart rate up. So you should be building up a bit of a sweat by the end. Um, and then in order to prepare for that, I would really be mindful of the layers that you're wearing. So depending on how cold it is, I would invest in just long sleeve technical fabric layers, windbreakers, maybe a long john, um, gloves, hats, just to name a few examples, maybe bring an extra pair of socks with you, but you never want to be the fact that you're not dressed properly. You don't want that to hinder the, the walk itself or the exercise itself. So. Fantastic. And, and then are there opportunities to get, you know, these, these walks are these opportunities for socializing too, you know, is this the kind of like group fitness is tricky, like, um, because some of the, you know, the gyms are, are closed now. And, uh, so can this be the group fitness for, function of things? Absolutely. So with group fitness, I mean, of course, in person group fitness has, has its advantages, but you could, replicate a lot of that virtually as well. So for example, I would have um, a recurring invite with family and friends weekly and um, hold each other accountable that way and actually make it fun and take turns on who the instructor is for the class. And um, it's, it's a great way to kind of get a little competitive with one another, do weekly check-ins with one another and just give each other motivating words. So um, yeah, you can still have fun with it virtually, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Amazing. Okay. Let's shift into food. Uh, Leslie, you were talking uh, in our lead up about how much, um, well, I'm not going to give your answer away. So I'm going to ask the question and then I'm not going to give your answer away. So winter is all about comfort foods. What are some to try out this winter? What are the benefits of comfort foods and how can we prevent the negative side effects like weight gain? So I'll hand this over to Leslie. Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so I often hear this from clients, you know, as soon as winter hits, they start craving carbohydrate rich comfort foods, whether that's pasta, mac and cheese. I talked to a client today, she was craving potatoes. It could even be chocolate chip cookies. And there may be a physiological reason for this. And it may have to do with the fact uh, that there's a lot less sunlight this time of year. So it's thought that winter food cravings for comfort foods uh, may be tied to levels of serotonin. And that's a brain chemical that helps to improve mood, it reduces our appetite, and it helps facilitate sleep as well. Um, and our brain's production of serotonin is lower in the winter months. And that's the time we tend to feel more lethargic, more down than compared to the summer. And so the theory goes that eating a carbohydrate rich comfort food can increase your brain's level of serotonin and make you feel better, at least temporarily that is. Um, but I should say it is often, it's also common to turn to comfort foods during stressful times like we're experiencing right now. Um, comfort foods are thought to blunt the body's stress response uh, by causing a release of dopamine, which is a feel-good brain chemical. Um, but you're right. So high calorie comfort foods eaten often, eaten in large portions could lead to winter weight gain. So a few strategies around that. Um, first of all, I, you know, I, I tell my clients, try to figure out what's motivating you in the first place to eat the food. If you're feeling stressed, Take 10, 15 minutes to unwind or distract yourself, do something else um, before automatically opening up the fridge to reach for something. And if you do decide you want the food, fine. It's going to be a conscious decision then. Uh, have a smaller portion. So for example, instead of eating potato chips out of the bag, put a small amount of potato chips in a small bowl. Pay attention to the fact that you're eating them. Savor them. Um, 
I also, I usually, I typically recommend that people include in their diet every week, once a week, their favorite food, whether that is, you know, ice cream, it might be nachos, it might be, oh, I, it could be potato chips, but include that the treat that you love so you don't feel deprived. Uh, and again, have a smaller portion. And some people find it's, 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 it's better if they include their favorite comfort food, a rich decadent one, as part of a meal, rather than just eating as a snack, as an impulse decision. Um, the other thing I would say too, you know what? There are lots of nutritious comfort foods that we can be enjoying that can, you know, satisfy your craving for comfort, but also provide nutrition. So for example, turkey chili, shepherd's pie with mashed cauliflower topping or sweet potato topping. Um, you might make pizzas like homemade pizzas with chicken and vegetables on thin whole wheat tortillas. If it's sweets you want, um, you might try a frozen banana ice cream. You might have homemade apple crisp. You might sip on a mug of homemade hot chocolate or even have a square dark, dark chocolate. So those are all ways to get some nutrition um, into uh, at the same time as um, enjoying your comfort food without too many calories. That's fantastic. Oh my gosh, you're making me hungry. Uh, and I, you're making me look forward to those, you know, those Sunday afternoons uh, when it's snowy outside yeah. and there's something bubbling on the stove. Uh, because actually that's one of the pleasures of winter, isn't it? Is, is those big kind of, you know, cooking afternoons. Uh, yeah, that's my Sunday in the winter. I, I just, it's relaxing and um, it's a time I really like to try new recipes or, or batch cook for the week. It's really, you know, that really is, uh, yeah, there are pleasures to winter is one, is, is one thing. Uh, okay, so let's talk about vitamin deficiency because uh, that's something that comes up, I think, pretty, pretty uh, commonly in terms of questions that come to you. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about vitamin deficiencies that might arise during winter and how to counteract them? Well, you know, I certainly can talk about sort of nutrients we should be focusing on, some that could be deficient as well. But I think, you know, in the winter, we're really focused on staying healthy and our immune health, and particularly so this year, right? Um, and so there are many different nutrients involved in the body's immune response, immune system. But I'll focus on just a few today, vitamin D, I'll talk a little bit about zinc and vitamin C, because those are ones that I get common questions about. So first of all, vitamin D is something that we all should be taking as a supplement right now. And that's because in Canada and in parts of the US, our skin makes little if any vitamin D from the lack of sun, uh, sunlight. Um, so that's really important. And vitamin D's best known role is helping our bodies absorb calcium and phosphorus from foods to help maintain strong bones. But we know the vitamins benefits extend beyond, um, beyond bone health. Most tissues in the body have receptors for vitamin D, your heart, your colon, your muscles, your brain, and your immune cells. So in other words, all of those tissues need vitamin D to function properly. Um, we Studies have shown that maintaining a sufficient level of vitamin D in the bloodstream is thought to protect against upper respiratory tract infection. In fact, randomized controlled trials conducted from 2007 to 2020 have shown protective effects of vitamin D supplementation against acute respiratory tract infections. Um, and while it is in the early days, um, recent research has suggested that there's a connection between vitamin D deficiency and COVID-19 susceptibility and severity, but there's no, I mean, this isn't proof. These studies only show an association. In general, I recommend 1,000 to 2,000 international units or IU of vitamin, three, uh, vitamin D3 per day from a supplement. Um, and you, but you know, some people may need more to maintain a sufficient blood level. So check in with your doctor um, if you're concerned. Um, zinc. Zinc is really important for the immune system as well. It's needed for the growth and development of immune cells. It helps the body produce antibodies. And research has found that among older adults, having a low level of vitamins, or, sorry, the zinc in the bloodstream is associated with twice as much pneumonia um, and uh, a longer duration of pneumonia and antibiotic use compared to people who have adequate levels of zinc. So in terms of food source, sources for zinc, oysters are a top food, but um, people aren't eating those every day. So things like beef, pork, chicken, 
Pumpkin seeds are amazing. So are cashews and chickpeas. Milk and yogurt are good sources as well. And you can also take a multivitamin and mineral supplement that has some zinc in it. And I certainly think that is a prudent thing to do to just to take a low dose, uh, a broad based multivitamin and mineral to cover off potential nutrient gaps in your diet. And that's especially so for older adults. Um, with respect to vitamin C, Yes, it's involved in the immune system. It has many other functions. Um, just to let you know, the official RDA recommended dietary allowance for vitamin C is 75 milligrams for women, 90 milligrams uh, for men. And those are amounts that many experts feel are too low for optimal health. Um, so some of these research, researchers recommend getting 200 to 400 milligrams of vitamin C a day. Um, when it comes to diet, I do recommend that people really try to include two very good sources, food sources of vitamin C every day in their diet. So things like, of course, we know citrus fruit is a good source, kiwi fruit, strawberries, mango, easy additions to a smoothie or a protein shake. Um, red and green bell peppers are amazing sources of vitamin C, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and if you like tomato juice, that's a good source as well. And yes, you can also take a supplement to top up your vitamin C, focus on food first. Um, I would recommend 500 milligrams of a vitamin C supplement once or twice uh, daily. You don't need to take more. At doses above 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, the amount that gets absorbed in your intestine falls um, to less than half. Fantastic. Just, uh, so one question that's that came up, and just because you, you mentioned zinc, it'll, and it directly uh, impacts this. Do you have to take zinc with another vitamin so it gets absorbed properly? No, you, you don't. And the other thing I want to make about talk to you about zinc. Um, there are some some people that have heard a lot about zinc and immune health. So they're taking separate supplements. The the safe upper limit of zinc is 45 milligrams a day. Remember, it's a mineral, it can store in your body. So don't take more than that. Get look to your diet and the amount that's in a multivitamin unless you have a deficiency in the in the mineral. Fantastic. Okay, thanks for that, Leslie. Um, Vacations. Okay, let's talk vacations. Vacations help many of us get through winter, uh, you know, going um, to Florida, going to Mexico, going to the Caribbean. And uh, most of us, most of us snowbirds are trapped north of the border this year. So how do we, how do we get the benefits of a vacation without actually having, uh, you know, without actually taking the vacation? Dr. John Danson, why don't you take this one and then uh, we can go to the other panelists if there's time. Uh, sure. Well, I'll say actually the same thing about vacations I do about weekends that uh, one of the most important things is the ways it shakes up our routine uh, with vacations. You know, if we're going to Florida or something like that, it's easy, different time zone, different weather, different people around us, different activities, different foods, different everything. Um, so on vacations, we don't have to pay attention to the fact that we're doing things outside of our routine. Uh, but those are things we are going to have to pay attention to if we're doing vacations from home or even from a cottage or something like that. Um, so I think the baseline idea is make sure you don't for, for sure, don't treat it like your normal routine, but also try not to treat it like your weekend routine, like, you know, five weekends in a row, that uh, kind of thing, which, you know, movies and all that kind of thing. Um, so try to shake up the routine, even in ways you don't normally on a weekend. Um, as an example, if people who go, let's say to Costa Rica, they might take, uh, go on a hike, even though they're not hikers, because that's what you do in Costa Rica. So you can replicate that kind of thing at home. You might be going for a hike in the snow, uh, but same kind of idea. Don't stick to your normal, enjoyable activities. That might feel fun, but it's not going to feel like a vacation. Um, really try to shake up and put uh, put yourself kind of outside of your comfort zone. Again, even if it's eating different foods and all that kind of stuff. Uh, as a quick example, when I was a kid, my parents couldn't afford to take us on beach vacations, things like that. So every year, once or twice, they take us to a hotel in downtown Toronto. Uh, I live just outside Toronto. That is not a vacation the way most people think about it. But as a kid, and I know for my parents as well, for them, just the change of scenery, you know, swimming in the pool, eating different food, different people around us and everything uh, makes a big difference in feeling like it's a real vacation rather than, you know, just a little break. Um, so yeah, just switch up the routine. Um, but in the end, nothing's going to replace, you know, an overseas vacation or something like that. So uh, obviously do some planning, but don't expect it to be the exact same. Fantastic. I, uh, I love the idea of you going, you know, going to a, a win, uh, in the middle of winter, going to, where was it? There was the Delta hotel that had the water slide in the middle. Anyway, that was a big one in our family. Um, Okay, let's talk. So final question uh, before we get to the uh, attendee questions is about 
sometimes focus or sometimes using kind of using this the season of winter as a mechanism uh to for self-improvement can be a way to help get through it and so in our research with with the panel we talked about the idea of a 100 day challenge so can can we talk about you know winter is about 100 days 100 day challenge um as a mechanism to get through it uh john why don't you start and then uh we can go to anna and leslie as well uh sure so i'll start with maybe a really quick one i think a 100 day mindfulness challenge is a good idea um it's the kind of thing you download an app like headspace or calm uh 10 minutes a morning follow along with what the you know what the app says to do you don't have to do a ton of research uh, and i would keep in mind you don't have to like it you don't have to be good at it you don't have to feel good after it um the goal should be doing it uh, if i'm going to quickly say maybe a little bit more of a detailed challenge um so there's two kinds of activities generally speaking that we do for leisure. There's pleasure activities and mastery activities. Uh, pleasure activities are exactly what they sound like. Anything that's just for pleasure, you know, watching a movie, you're reading a novel, hanging out with a friend or whatever. Um, mastery activities are anything that need a skill to perform or involve building a skill. People tend to lean one way or the other with their leisure time. Either they're heavy on, heavy on pleasure, pleasure and low on mastery or vice versa. So I want to challenge everyone to do one pleasure and one mastery activity every day. Uh, so again, one kind of wasted time just for fun activity and then one that's focused on building a skill um, it could be exercising would it be included in mastery um, again picking up a new hobby or working on a hobby reading for learning rather than just for leisure um, so i want to challenge everyone to mix a little bit of both every day fantastic uh anna do you want to talk about your challenge absolutely um i actually had a great suggestion from one of the trainers so i can't take credit for this one her name's jen bailey and her suggestion was accumulating a certain amount of mileage over a hundred days. So pick your mileage depending on your um, experience level, but let's say you're picking a hundred kilometers, get them in any way you can. So whether that's walking, running, cycling, swimming, cross, cross country skiing, you record every day how many kilometers you did. And I mean, maybe you reach your goal sooner than a hundred days, but Kind of play around with that and i would also challenge family and friends to do the same so get everybody involved fantastic uh leslie you had some thoughts on this as well yeah i did i i think my 100 day challenge uh would be to create a very sh a short um daily checklist that will help keep you focused on your nutrition and eating habits uh, i would i would challenge people to list five diet related habits that you want to build over the next 100 days, ones that are important to you that make sense to you. So for example, someone's uh, daily checklist might include number one, eat one plant based meal a day, and that could be breakfast, peanut butter and toast and a, and a smoothie or something. Number two might be eat two vitamin C rich foods every day. Number three, take my vitamin D supplement. Number four, drink two to three liters of water or number five, speaking to um, Dr. Danson's mindfulness, don't eat meals while you're distracted, it, whether that's watching TV or reading the paper, checking your emails. So that's that could be one per person's list, but make your list, put it somewhere where you're gonna see it every day and then check off the boxes at the end of the day. Obviously your end goal is four out of, or five out of five, but three out of five, four to four is just fine too. You know, you've got tomorrow to work on it. And I think the point is here that you're going to be focused on this every day and you're building a few habits over, over the winter. Fantastic. Well, thanks for that. Now we're going to switch over to our questions. Um, so yeah, we, and we do have uh, quite a few. We're at one, uh, one o'clock now. So we're, let's take five minutes. We'll go to one Oh five and, uh, and, and try to whip through some of these questions. So um, uh, Dr. John Danson, I think this one is for you. How to not get depressed over Christmas when this is the first year that you can't spend it with your family due to COVID restrictions? Do you have any tips there? Yeah, good question. So let me first of all differentiate between kind of sadness and depression. Um, sadness is normal. I don't want anyone to feel like they're not allowed to be sad. Um, even negative emotions that feel bad are still healthy for you. So you're you're gonna feel sad, that's normal. I don't wanna encourage, it's not that you can't do something to try to feel less sad, but the sadness is normal. And I don't wanna send the message that you have to you have to do something to cure it. Um, and that's compared to depression, which is more of a syndrome. So it's not just sadness, but loss of interest in activities. You might overeat or undereat, oversleep or undersleep, low energy, um, you know, low self-worth and things like that. All that being said, I do think we have to accept this isn't gonna be the normal kind of Christmas for most of us. And I'd say, try not to make it an all or nothing. So. I know this might sound kind of lame, but 
Zoom people in if you can. Uh, I know for, for my family or my extended family, um, we're doing a kind of a gift exchange in a park kind of thing. It's not the same, um, but we're trying to keep some of it rather than just kind of canceling it all together. Um, so overall, again, I think feel sad if you need to feel sad, that's normal, but try to not throw away all the traditions if there's some kind of halfway that you can do some of them uh, and maybe an opportunity to develop some, some new traditions. Yeah, and Dr. John Dancy, you also talked in something else that this is normal too, like the, the, to normalize the feeling of sadness that, that, that it is sad. You know, we are, uh, th this is a sad thing to not see loved ones and, and that's okay, it's okay to feel sad. That's uh, exactly it. I yeah. think we, we too often use negative emotions to say something negative and that we need to stop them, but often negative emotions are just doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Fantastic. Um, uh, Leslie, can you please repeat the amount of vitamin D per day that is recommended? And actually, folks, we do, um, we do archive these on our uh, YouTube um, channel uh, after, so you can repeat. If you did miss anything, we can, you can go back tomorrow and we'll send the link out to our YouTube uh, archive of this. But let's say, yeah, what uh, yeah. vitamin D per day that is recommended? Well, what I, what I had said, what I generally recommend um, is 1,000 to 2,000 international units of vitamin D3 from a supplement per day, particularly late fall and winter months. Um, the daily requirement, uh, you know, from Health Canada is a little bit lower. It depends. Let's put it this way. Osteo, the daily requirement is based on bone health. And, um, and, and it, it's, it's, it's it aimed at keeping your blood level at a sufficient level for bone health. Um, so generally for adults, that's um, six uh, up to age 50, that's or up to age 70, that's 600 international units a day, older adults, 800. Osteoporosis Canada recommends that um, adults get 800 to 2000 international units a day, depending on risk factors. But again, it really does depend on your blood level of vitamin D uh, to where you're at now, what's going to maintain that sufficient level. But in general, 1000 to 2000 international units for healthy people is completely safe. The upper safe daily limit is 4000 IU per day. Fantastic. Um, so someone asked, and actually this dovetails into uh, another response. So could we have more suggestions of indoor exercise activities? Most of us already know about yoga and Pilates videos on YouTube. So it'd be great to have more inspiration. So um, I think uh, Kim from CSEP is on here and she uh, mentions the CSEP guidelines, which suggest uh, the new 24 hour movement guidelines that the whole day matters. And so housework uh, or stairs or playing with pets and kids, they all contribute to your exercise goals. Anna, can you, uh, can you open this up a little bit and talk about other things um, in addition to, which I love your Simon says, I'm actually gonna use that with my own six-year-old, um, but anything else? In terms of- Indoor um, physical activity uh, suggestions. I mean, burpees. So one, I, I wrote a book with uh, uh, the guy who debuted high intensity interval training and his, his thing, was burpees like his? He said, "If you're going to do one single, so this is a McMaster prof, Marty Gabala, who he said, if you're going to do one thing, burpees is it? Do do burpees? Uh, but what what else uh, would you suggest? I mean, at home for for just body weight exercises, and like you said, burpees. There's tons of options that you could research and create your own little mini circuits." I would also say on top of that, um, stretching right now is also really important. So because we're sitting down, just hunched, like chest, everything concave all day long, I think it's really important to just open ourselves up. So maybe like a stretch in a door, door frame would be a good one, arm on either side and just step forward. Um, so not quite so much about like in regards to getting the heart rate up, but I do think they, like they do go hand in hand really well because doing something like a dynamic burpee after having sat for so many hours without the proper warm up and stretching beforehand, higher risk for injury. So incorporating the stretching. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, okay. We're coming into um, uh, a little more time on uh, or, or the end of our time. So one thing I want to uh, talk about is what we have coming up and what other content uh, from MedCan. So one of the people asked, what is the current recommendations for walks with friends and family, masks or masks not required? So that actually dovetails pretty easily and pretty well into 
what we have coming up. And so I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, so we've got that and I'm going to, what am I going to do? Start slideshow. Sorry, this is way from start. Okay, so um, how to get together safely during the holidays. So that's, this is our next, uh, this is our next webinar. So not, not many people actually know this, but MedCan has a medical advisory services team that works with some of Canada's largest companies to ensure their work sites and their employees are safe through COVID. So the same team applying their knowledge to help Canadians. Uh, so, so the same team is now what we're going to do December 1st with the next webinar is take their knowledge and apply it to winter gatherings, apply it to family gatherings, to holiday gatherings. What's safe? What are some of the things that we can do to gather safely? We're going to be uh, mindful of, of current recommendations. You know, if the premier and other public health uh, guidelines are don't gather at all, then, you know, take those into account. But if gathering is allowed and, and if we have, you know, 10 person gatherings, what are some things that you can do to mitigate the risk of the gathering? Do you open your windows to increase airflow? Do you wear masks? When is masks appropriate? Do you have uh, separate uh, entrance and exit uh, for, you know, if the food is on the dining room do you, to, to minimize um, gatherings? You know, we're basically what we're doing is taking the advice we've given to corporations and applying it to families and gatherings in order to help them get, get, through, the, uh, get through the year. Next, so uh, MedCan presents other resources. So Eat, Move, Think podcast, which just uh, Google Eat, Move, Think podcast to find this. Uh, it went on Apple Podcasts, went on Google Podcasts, went on Spotify and everything else. Are You Getting Enough Sleep is episode 40, which is pretty crazy to think we're at episode 40. That's with Dr. Jean-Philippe Chaput. That's who is uh, pictured in the uh, photo. We asked him for a photo and that's what he provided us. And that's about, uh, that's MedCan CEO, Sean Francis, providing the latest, uh, latest recommendations on sleep and also um, what to, you know, the science on sleep, which is, is pretty great. One final thing before we go, I wanted to say that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, the news has been very, very good these last couple of days in terms of vaccines. So Moderna vaccine is 94.5%. The Pfizer vaccine is 90%. And so winter is going to be tough. Let's, let's, uh, let's confront that head on. It's going to be a hard season, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I just wanted to kind of leave, you know, I think we have a lot of frequent um, at attendees on these webinars. And I just wanted to say, you know, we're going to have a tough season, but we have a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Leslie Beck, thank you. Anna Topali, thank you. Dr. Jonathan Danson, thank you. Really appreciate it. Webinar attendees, thanks for your wonderful questions. We will put this on uh, YouTube and we'll send out the link uh, either later today or first thing tomorrow. Thanks very much, folks.